Hello and welcome to our ongoing series of QHSE webinars presented by Mango. Hello to everyone joining us on the live webinar and a big hello to those viewing this as a recording. In this webinar, you'll find out how to transition to the new version of ISO 9001. My name's Craig Thornton and I'm one of the owners here at Mango. Go ahead, connect with me on LinkedIn. On LinkedIn, I post QHSE articles daily from things I have picked up around the world, and you might find those interesting. So also jump onto my blog on my website. You can get details on how Mango created its own quality management system and how we then achieved ISO 9001 2015 certification. Uh, you can even download our integrated management systems manual for free there too. So go ahead and do that. Also on our website is a bunch of free resources that you can download. Uh, free, ma free other system manuals, free forms, free checklists, and free presentations on things like internal auditing, health and safety stuff, quality systems, and environmental management. So just go to mangolive.com, click on the resources ta tab, and download what you like. So housekeeping rules for today. Uh, you can interact with the presenter, Sean, uh, at any time. So please ask questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar uh, application. As we go along, I'll pause the webinar and with our panelists, we'll answer those questions. We do have a question and answer session at the end anyway, so you know we can uh, answer any questions at the end. So please interact at any time. Uh, the slides, they will advance automatically throughout the webinar. Uh, I'll be recording this webinar, which I'm doing at the moment, just checking my recording. Uh, and within 24 hours, I'll send you all a link to this presentation. This will be a video of the presentation plus all the slides. Um, so if you miss something during the live presentation, you can view that later. Uh, please share this presentation with your colleagues. And finally, I'm just booking the next webinar, uh, just trying to make an announcement very soon for that. So that'll be for next month. Look out for the next webinar. So on to today's topic, the transition from 9001, 2008 and to uh, the 2015 version is coming up fast. The deadline to be certified is September 20, uh, uh, 2018. Uh, so in preparation for this presentation, I looked at some statistics uh, on who's actually certified in New Zealand and Australia to 9001. And the stats show that 69% of all those companies that are certified still haven't transitioned to the latest standard um, in New Zealand, 62% in Australia. So in raw numbers, that's about 800 companies in New Zealand and about 4,000 companies in Australia still haven't transitioned. Uh, and you've only got 12 months. So I did a rough calculation. Uh, so per working day, three companies in New Zealand and 16 companies in Australia need to transition in the next 12 months. Uh, so for those people listening in other countries, I imagine the percentages are about the same. So I'd estimate 60% of all companies that are in your country still haven't transitioned to the 2015 version. So, uh, so it's a pretty hot topic at the moment. Just by chance, a customer was in our office this morning and uh, they've been told uh, they've just been certified to the old 2008 standard and that they need to transition by March next year so that the audit company doesn't get inundated with so many audits by the end of September. So I wouldn't wait till later next year. I would get onto it now. That's why we've got this presentation with you today. Uh, so on to our panelist. Uh, our panelist is Sean Bannian. Sean is the owner and business consultant at Kaizen Consulting based in Auckland in here in New Zealand. You should visit his website, kaizengold.co.nz, if you need help with your transitioning at any sta stage uh, and or if you want a gap analysis. Sean's uh, direct contact details are there on the screen. So some of Sean's recent companies that he's helped or uh, that uh, Kaizen Consulting has, has already helped uh, is Etel uh, Limited in Auckland, Gallagher Group, which is a famous company in New Zealand, in Hamilton, and Gallagher Fuel Systems based in Martin in uh, the uh, North Island here in New Zealand. So Sean, over to you on this really uh, interesting and important topic. Go ahead. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks, Greg, for giving me the opportunity. Um, so let's get on with it. Um, I've got an agenda here. Um, the first topic we're going to cover is the ISO 9001 overview. Um, we're going to cover the purpose of the standard, why has the standard been revised, transition timeline, 
what remains the same with the new version of the standard. Um, the second um, main topic would be the key changes um, that we are facing with the new standard. Um, transition from ISO 9001-2008 to the 2015 version, so I've got a project plan um, to assist you. Um, and then uh, we're going to cover um, um, a topic of why transition can be treated as an opportunity. And we're going to allocate some time for questions. All right, so ISO 9001 main benefits. I've categorized them to four. Um, ISO 9001 provides a set of uniform requirements for quality management system. It reflects a good level of professionalism for your organization. Also confirms that your organization is complying with any regulations applicable to those products and services. Um, it enhances your customer satisfaction and um, achieve continual improvement of its performance. It also certifies that the organization ensures that its products and services satisfy the customer quality requirements and expectations. Um, why has the standard been revised? Um, ISO standard are review and revised roughly around every seven years. Um, ISO needs to reflect industry changes in order to stay relevant. Um, the 2015 standard follows the same overall structure as other ISO management standards, the Annex SL. So that is one of the main um, changes in the new standard. Um, also, the challenges faced by business and organization has changed due to globalization and uh, operation of complex supply chain, so should the standard. The transition timeline, as um, Craig briefly mentioned, um, the standard has been published in September 2015, and your organization um, has had three years to um, transition to the new standard. So, it is worth noting that um, from September 14, 2018, you are no longer certified if you're still holding the ISO 9001-2008 version. Also worth noting that ISO 14001 also uses Annex SL as its core text and high-level structure. So any learning you undertake in preparation of the new standard for ISO 9001-2015 is also applicable for um, 14001. Um, and also in the future when ISO 14, uh, 45001, the new ISO standard for occupational health and safety replaces the um, OSAS 18, 18001. Um, it also uses the same structure. So that would be a good opportunity for companies who would like to have integrated management system. Um, so you're sharing the, the, the overall structure of it. What remains the same? Um, everyone asks what remains the same between the 2008 and 2015 version. Management review remains the same, corrective actions, um, customer satisfaction, control of non-conforming products, um, internal audits and process control. Um, obviously, there would be some um, sub, sub, subjects that are remaining the same, but um, these are the main categories of or the groups of um, things that remain the same between the two standards. The structure of the 2015 standard follows the plan do check tag. You will hear me a lot um, mentioning the PDCA cycle throughout um, this presentation. Um, that's just a way of thinking. And, and a way for businesses to to um, do the um, go through the phases of implementation um, uh, in a structural manner. So um, if you review the the clauses, clause four context of organization, clause five leadership um, planning, clause six and support for clause seven, they're all fall falling under the plan sector. Um, in do, we have um, clause number eight, operations. Um, for checking, we have clause number nine, performance evaluation. And improvement, that would be the last clause in act. Um, so we're going to go through some of the key changes in um, the new standard. Uh, one is process approach. <clears throat> the interaction between controlled processes that make up your quality management system. Management strategy to achieve consistent and predictable results. Consideration of processes in terms of requirements. Improvement of processes based on evaluation of data and information. 
Um, it's worth noting that process approach was promoted in the 2008 version, but it is now a requirement in 2015 um, standard, and we definitely um, support that decision about ISO because businesses move towards more process approach, um, um, uh, process approach business practice. The key benefits of um, having process approach organization, it's your ability to identify and focus on critical processes, um, achievement of consistent and predictable outcome for your organization, um, reduction of cross-functional barriers between your um, different functions and business units, uh, units in your organization, and the increased efficiency, um, efficiency and effectiveness of your process management. Um, another key change would be the context of your organization. So we've got interested parties. It's a, um, it's a new terminology that have been introduced um, in 2015. Um, it's basically persons or organization that can, ha that can affect or be affected by a decision or activity that your co company does. Um, these are like your customers, suppliers, staff. We have further examples coming in the next slide. You need to have process in place to monitor and review the information about your interested parties and their requirements. And your organization also needs to develop a methodology to, to understand the needs and expectation of all these interested parties. So these are some of the examples of the um, interested parties, your employees, union, suppliers, stakeholders, regulators, end users, local community, customers. So if you notice one thing they have all in common is they can have an impact on your organization and what you do has an impact on them. So we've got an example here. Um, so this is a table that um, we've put together for a customer example of interested party. So if we have, um, if we list customer as one of the interested party, um, is it internal or external impact that customers have on you? Is external? What is the objective of having that um, as uh, having them as interested party to achieve revenue targets, retain contract, increase repeat orders? Um, the needs and expectation that they have from you is the consistency of quality, competitiveness of price, and delivery of products and services. Power and interest rank, which we don't have um, time to cover here, um, is, is basically managed closely. It's a matrix that you put. It's not a requirement of the standard. It's, it's just we recommend it's a good practice to put your interested parties in a matrix and know how well you need to manage them or, um, or just keep them as monitoring. A requirement of your quality management system from this inter interested party, which is a customer. So products and services a specification for designs. So that's what something that you expect from your customer to be specific on, on their um, specification that they require from you. Manufacturer delivery, support documentations, and other requirements. What um, aspect of this product and services process um, or activity um, do you have in, in, your, in your organization? So you have your customer service, customer um, corrective action requests, so that's how you monitor the performance against that interested parties. And you would put who is responsible in the company, who's accountable for, um, for uh, managing that interested party. In that example, we put sales and marketing manager. So you will just go ahead and develop same sort of concept with every single one of your interested parties, which I would assume would be more than the list that we've put here. Um, another one, we have internal and external issues. So your organization is now required to identify and assess all internal and external issues that could impact upon your quality management system's ability to deliver its intended results. Um, We've put an example of SWOT analysis here. This is um, just something that we recommend businesses to use. You may have um, all sort of different um, analysis uh, matrices for yourself. So we have strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats. The strengths are basically what you can, what you do well, what internal resources um, you have, and um, what stand um, you apart from all your competitors. And the weakness would be which areas need improvement, 
Are there any constraints in availability of your resources? What does your business lack? Um, opportunities would be the, um, the opportunities that exist in the market. Um, how can this benefit your organization? Had there been changes in the market recently? And threats could be who are your potential competitors? Is there anything reducing your revenues or profit? What threatens your marketing effort? Um, so basically, um, these are all the things that would be your internal or external issues that you, you will have to um, identify, monitor, and evaluate. The scope of your quality management system. When determining the scope, the requirement of interested parties are considered. The scope of quality management system should be determined in consideration to your organization context. So again, we will follow the plan, do, check, act um, uh, methodology. So in planning, this would be your policies, resources, objectives, do processes, indicators, product realization, in check, audits, validations, verifications, and ACT would be your whole continuous improvement um, system that you have in place, preventative actions, corrective actions. Risks and opportunities. Can I, can I, just, um, pause, can I just pause you there, yeah. make a comment? Yeah. Um, so as for, for Mango here, we, we achieved 9,001 um, 2015, a couple of months ago, and we found the, the whole context of the organization, that whole new section for 9001 has been unbelievably beneficial because we managed to think, go through that exact process, all our interested parties, all the different issues, did the SWOT analysis. But what we have we determined at the time is that we could link all of that information because we'd already done that as part of our business planning. We'd already done some of that, but it was always separate from our quality system. So what we did was we managed to join, using the context, we managed to join our business planning, our, our you know, setting our goals for the business, join them together so that our quality system managed and, and connected with our business planning and um, setting objectives for the company. So it was a really, really valuable exercise. That's exactly right, that's exactly right. So basically all of these things, they're, they're not really new practices for businesses. The 2015 has a very practicable uh, approach to, to businesses and a lot of these things, as you mentioned, you know, SWOT analysis or some sort of um, risk to your business and, and the mm. um, evidence-based thinking and all of that, they all exist in the business. Now, this is a really good opportunity to actually link them all together, bring them under one umbrella and manage them um, much better and, and easier. Mm. Yep, excellent. Keep going. So risks and opportunities, um, so determine, consider, and where necessarily take action to address any risks and opportunities that might impact your quality management system ability to deliver conformance or, or which might adversely impact customer satisfaction. Um, it is worth mentioning that um, risks and opportunities um, existed in 2008 version. Um, it's just our recommendation that you would um, manage them based on the, you know, the, the, the likelihood consequence and, and it's, it's just a much easier, better approach that we recommend. This is, this is um, the first bit of it is, is a requirement, but the second part is actually our recommendation of how you would manage those risks and opportunities. Um, so the, um, very much same as the health and safety, you could have a probability impact matrix, a likelihood consequence, and um, you know, Mango um, has a um, risk management module that um, you know for those of you who use Mango is actually pretty good. Um, this is basically just put a simple um, um, uh, table here to to indicate to you what are the type of fields that you would require. Um, to have or it's recommended to, to, to have. Um, so you will have a risk ID, source of the risk or opportunity that's coming up, um, description of it, impact, probability, um, you have some sort of calculation on that, this have uh, made it to the nine significance, um, the score nine. Um, you would have some sort of action, um, who's responsible, what sort of resource we have to manage that risk, what's the deadline, evaluation date, um, some comments, and um, you need to go through the whole um, identifying the issue, implementation, or action, and then have a checking or review stage, and then evaluate it and close, okay? So um, on this example, 
um, emerging number of paint issues in, in certain department that is um, likely to have an impact um, on, a, on the customer. This is a really good opportunity to actually raise it to the attention of your top management that this quality defect is actually going to impact our business. Okay, so that is the approach that um, ISO wants you to have. Um, products and services. Um, the term products in 2008 is now being referred to products and services. Um, it's basically the intention of ISO has been to incorporate a bigger market of, of other things than products being being sold as, as services, you know. Um, so previously there have been a gray area of, well, that's a physical product. The services that we offer is not our product. So it is, you know, ISO is now defining them that th that is your product. So certain products and services are now the new terminology um, that has replaced products. <coughs> Um, it reinforces the idea that quality management systems are applicable to all types of business and not just manufacturing or supplying products. It also helps you to focus on consistency of uh, providing the products and services that meet your co customer's um, requirement and expectation. Also ensures that your organization has the ability to meet defined requirements. Um, so this is also another important uh, aspect of, of um, the ISO standards in general, um, to say what is your defined requirements that your customer is expecting from you. Um, next um, change, we have control of externally provided um, products and services. So in 2008, Clause 7.4, purchasing um, was a terminology that has been used. Um, now that has been uh, replaced by control of externally provided products and services for the same um, logic and reasoning that we've, we've talked about. This clause addresses all types of external provision, purchasing from a supplier or through the outsourcing of products and processes. Um, your organization now is required to take a risk-based approach um, to <clears throat> determine the type um, and extent of um, controls that is appropriate. Again, an example that we recommend that you use is the impact and the market opportunity. So basically you have low or high impact, easy or difficult market opportunity. And if it's a supplier that um, um, has a really low impact, if, if that product that your supplier supplies you has a low impact on your business, and also it's easy to, to find it in the market, then basically it falls um, under the routine category and um, you would manage it completely different compared to something that has a high impact and is also very difficult to um, source it in the market. So that makes it your strategic um, category and you would manage it much closely. Can I just pause you there, um, yeah. Sean? Um, just go back to that slide. Um, so I've run a previous webinar on this as well for um, for contractor management in, in health and safety where you don't treat every supplier or every contractor the same. You base it on that that risk-based approach um, you've got there where, you know, the routine ones, you you, 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 you basically don't touch them. But if, there's, if they're str strategic or there's there's a, a bottleneck or there's leverage there, you, you, you actually manage them differently and you... Um, make sure that the controls around those ones are, are much tighter. So um, it's they're, they're, they're good business practices that I see when I go around and visit customers. They, they manage their suppliers and contractors exactly the same, whether they're you know, low impact or high impact or um, you know, easy or difficult market opportunity. Um, quality managers, we need to get away from doing that and base it on risk so that you spend more time on those ones that are are more important to your business than than those that aren't. So um, this is a really another really good clause that's come in that um, you know all, all companies should be doing and should be really thinking about this. Going on, yes. go on, Sean. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And also, same concept applies to the risk-based um, thinking, uh, risks and opportunities. So everything, you know, you, when you have a quality defect, 
you need to the, the amount of resources that you put into um, resolving that um, has to be appropriate to the risk that it um, imposes to your business you know so sure. the same concept of your externally provided products and services applies to your internal defects applies to your risks opportunities that's a, that's a really good point that you've touched on um, so, and it's nicely leading to our next um, change, which is evidence-based decision-making. Um, so some of the key benefits to that. Um, so again, this is this is um, um, a, a key change. Um, it, it still existed in 2008. I think the, um, the reason that I've included them in the key change is, um, key changes section is basically the emphasis that the 2015 standard has on those evidence-based um, decision-making. Um, key benefits of it, um, decisions based um, on analysis and evaluation of KPIs, data, and information. Um, it also enhances your ability to achieve your um, objectives. Um, it's much easier um, uh, for you to do a process evaluation on it because you're basing it on facts. It also enhances your ability to demonstrate the effectiveness of those processes. Some of the actions that you could take to to, to um, enhance these aspects of your business is determine, measure, and monitor KPIs, uh, make data available, um, and also consider um, exception reporting. These are our recommendation. Um, exception reporting meaning that um, sometimes when there is too much information. Uh, um, for, for managers or staff, they would just ignore it. So just give them the information they need to act on. Um, reduction of your um, cross-functional barriers, that also really helps. Um, and also ensuring that your people are competent on um, data analysis, also really key factor. Documented information, an interesting one. <laughs> um, documented information, um, these are your requirements for documented quality manual, documented procedures and records that have been removed and replaced with the term documented information, okay? And documented information are considered information um, uh, that your organization requires to control, retain, and maintain. These are meaningful data that um, your company requires to have um, quality Policy, quality objectives, quality management systems, and they could be in any format. Okay, so some companies would have them um, more digitally. Uh, some people will, uh, um, some people and organization would still have a hard copy of them. But um, you are actually um, um, able to have them in any format that you want. What's what's practicable to your business? So just to sum up this um, key oh, changes just, section. Just, just before yeah. that, Sean, can I just make a, a comment on documented information? Yeah. So obviously there's a requirement for having a quality manu manual has been removed. But for our example here at Mango, we decided to keep our quality manual purely because we wanted to use it as a communication tool with inside of the business. There's no requirement to, for it to be documented, but we decided and chose to use it as purely because we think it's a good tool and that um, you know it, it helps arguments, it, it helps staff understand what happens, it helps us make decisions. So if we have to make a decision, we always go back to the manual and say, well, what does the manual say? How are we supposed to make that decision? So um, yes, there is a requirement, there, there is no requirement to have a quality manual, but we actually do, do have a quality manual and we do have some of our critical processes documented in documented procedures and um, we have records um, that, are, that are documented so that was just a, just a point I wanted to yeah. make that we actually we actually oh, we actually chose to, to keep the quality manual even though it's not a requirement that's exactly right and a lot of companies I've worked with also um, ha have made the same decision and I'm I'm fan of that as well because um, it's, it's just really to what extent you want to go to not having documented information you know um, to me the threshold is, is when you feel that something is not being referred to and it would just sit on the shelf then there is no need 
to have it. But as a as a business practice, it is actually we recommend it. It is actually good practice to have at least the overall, you know, the quality management system. It, it puts that overall process of how we do the business and what what is our policy, what is the uh, what are the objectives that we're trying to um, um, achieve here. So it's it's um, yes, it is. Um, you're not required to have. Um, you know, to the nth degree of everything, documenting everything, and it, it would just become a couple of hundred um, pages of manual sit on the shelf and nobody would refer to, but also not going to the other extreme of saying, well, every, everything is verbally communicated here because, um, you know, day two, you'll have different versions of the, you know, the Chinese whisper. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just to wrap that up, this is, um, these are the... Um, summary of um, um, the terminologies that have been changed um, um, between the two standards. So we've got the 2008 on the left column. So what was referred as products is now being referred as products and services. Um, documentation, quality manual, documented procedures, records and instructions are now being referred as documented information. Work environment is now being referred as environment for the operation of processes. Monitoring and measuring equipment is now called monitoring and measuring resources. Purchase product, as we discussed earlier, called um, externally provided products and services. Supplier are now referred as external provider. And a um, couple of new terminologies um, in the new standard, and that would be leadership and risk. Um, so previously in 2008, um, it was called representative, uh, uh, management representative. Um, and um, basically what um, 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 2015 is trying to do is put a lot more emphasis on the top management or the leadership team to be involved in setting the objectives, monitoring, evaluation, making decisions. It's, um, it's a lot um, of similarity with the approach um, that health and safety, you know, the new standard of health and safety is is, is proposing um, uh, for businesses and recommending for businesses. Um, so all those requirements are the same. Now top management can delegate their responsibilities. Um, so it's the same approach with the 2015 version. And risks, um, which we covered in previous slides. Um, so these are all the terminology changes. Okay, so now we are into transition to 2015. Okay, what do we do? What do we do to transition now? Now we know um, what has changed, we know why is it changing, and the, those key changes, now what do we do? We've put a um, um, plan here, again, we broke it down to PDCA approach. In your planning um, section, you have gap analysis, plan of approach, so you need to put a plan together, then doing would be the implementation, then we've got auditing and process analysis as your check, and the act side of it would be obtaining your certifications and communication side of it. So, the plan. First, you need to purchase a copy of the standard if you haven't already. Um, review the standard, make notes of those changes for the requirements. Develop a cross-functional and multidisciplinary team, including top management, to plan out the transition and implementation. I personally think that's actually one of the most important steps that you will take throughout the project, you know. So you need to make it very clear from the beginning that this is not, um, you know, a, a one man or one woman, woman's project, you know. This is a group um, effort. This is something that top management needs to buy into. They need to um, uh, commit to the resources that their them or their, their team is going to, to put into this project. So it's, um, it would really pay off to clarify those in the beginning of the project. Um, identifying the key milestone for the project, and you'll have to do a, um, um, a gap analysis to identify the areas that you need to focus um, for your transition. 
um, then you will have to review any documents or records that are unnecessarily or have become obsolete. So as um, mentioned before, um, you need to find that fine line for your business and what's what's practicable for you to to um, to have. You don't need to go to the nth degree of um, documents and processes and manuals, but also you need to um, be honest to yourself and say what's being used, what's being referred to, and what's not being referred to. You know, uh, as an example, if you have, um, um, you know, if you're producing electrical equipment and you have a process for your electrical test, you wouldn't say, oh, okay, let's just remove a document because it's, um, you know, it's more convenient. We don't need to update it. Then all of a sudden you get all these variations of, um, you know, new staff or some of the existing staff not knowing how to do electrical tests, you know. So you really need to find where is that that line for your business, you know, what, what do you need to obsolete, what do you not need? Um, focus on the document and, and records that is required by the standard. Um, uh, and again, that would be, that might be your quality management system um, that is um, effectively and efficiently being maintained and used um, so this is this is where you make that decision that what what you want to be um, included um, as as your uh, documented information. Uh, identify gaps in uh, for your new processes. So you know, example of it would be the risks and opportunities that we discuss. If you don't have a process for that, um, then that's that's something that you would identify in your um, gap analysis. Um, you also need to do um, a detailed management review of your implementation plan. This is where you actually put your plan um, forward, um, identify how much resources you need, and you need um, how much, um, uh, you know, uh, how many hours do you need to allocate to it from your team, from other people's team, um, um, and, and so on. For the transition, um, you need to identify your process owners that need to, um, understand their obligations for managing um, their defined processes. The internal uh, governance team, as I've mentioned, um, so such as internal auditors, that um, they also need to understand the specific requirements around the context, leadership, performance. In um, implementation, you have the in-depth analysis of those individual gaps that you found in your quality management system, the deficiencies and processes that have been involved. You need to focus your effort on the key processes. So um, again, um, same concept as the risks um, and, and opportunities. You know, you have review of interested parties. You know they're, they're your, um, the key processes that you need to try to um, implement and, and, and produce in order for your transition. Um, therefore, you would focus on those areas. Um, you need to define your interested parties and their impact on your business. Um, you need to define your organization provided products and services in the quality management system. Um, this is actually um, pretty straightforward, but um, you would be surprised how many companies would not have a clear understanding of their services that they provide, you know. So, so um, everyone, you know, products would be much more straightforward. Everyone would know, oh, yeah, that's the product we're selling. But in services, you know, you, you have to define them in your quality management system that um, your customers would be clear on it, um, that these are the services that you produce, uh, that you provide. Um, then you need to archive all those obsolete documents, records, and manuals that you've identified that you no longer need. And this is when you start revising the current quality management system and um, the quality policy to comply to the 2015 standard. In checking, um, you would evaluate and do uh, uh, evaluation, evaluate the gap analysis that you've done and check um, the effectiveness of it. You would perform a full system internal audit to verify in, uh, implementation and critical processes. Um, and you take action if necessary to address implementation problems and improve the system. Um, and 
in Act um, section, um, you confirm that all gaps um, have been closed. Organization quality management system complies with the new standard. Um, you all also make sure that your management team are clear on their responsibilities around the ISO standard. A good example of this would be the, um, the, the customer example we made on interested party that sales and marketing manager has been um, allocated to be the, the responsible person, you know. So overall, whether it's interested parties or overall those critical processes, you need to define that um, who are the, um, the, the management team that are responsible for it. You would um, ensure that your staff are competent on internal auditing to the new standard. Um, an effective internal auditing system is in place in your organization and it is showing the positive trend in reducing specific quality defects. Um, this is my favorite part um, personally. You know, um, we do all this documentation, we do all these gap analysis and we make sure that we uh, certify to the latest standard but um, at the end of the day you need to have that um, reflection with yourself to say what, what is the purpose of doing all of this you know um, put some tangible um, um, goals for yourself you know so you could sell it back to the to the stakeholders you, you could you could sell the idea you say um, look we've we've reduced the internal defects in certain departments or you know that that process hasn't been um, clear so that we've identified that internal um, um, uh, issue or external issue or our customers now as our interested parties are being more informed on what we're doing um, so um, this is this is my favorite part that the effectiveness of all everything that we do that's that's something that we need to take proud pride of um, and then you get certified by a certification um, audit body that's the last, and then you would communicate that. So communication of the, your upgrade to your interested party, customers, suppliers, employees, union, stakeholders, have, as we mentioned, um, um, any interested party that you're having an impact on or they're having impact on you, um, you need to um, actually um, inform them of all the changes that you're making and, and um, manage them closely. You demonstrate your gains and tangible outcomes to top management and continue the journey of continuous improvement. Um, this is the last slide. I'd um, like to, um, uh, again, um, emphasize on um, embracing this change and um, taking this transition as an opportunity. Okay, so I've, I've put five um, bullet points on, on um, the, the key important things that um, this transition can offer you as a business um, for con continuous improvement, basically. Um, so this would be an opportunity for you to take a fresh look at your quality management system, what you're doing as a whole business and how you're managing your entire quality, quality processes. Um, review effectiveness of it. Um, so again, um, it's it's an opportunity to to review how effective all those processes are and the gaps that you find in your processes. Um, this is your opportunity to to get more buy-in from your um, leadership team, involve them more, and and um, uh, make them clear on their responsibilities. Um, then treat key changes as um, the opportunities for improvement. Again, um, um, one way of looking at it is, is um, well, we have a gap to fill, but also is, um, you know, the, the, an international organization has um, um, identified that this is an area where businesses, um, in order to be certified to an international standard, businesses need to meet. Um, so th take this as an opportunity for improvement to, to, to embrace. And the last one is, um, you know, the risks and opportunities embedded in your business as usual. Um, it's something that would um, definitely bring tangible outcomes to your business, uh, and it's it's uh, it would be so easy to sell it to your stakeholders that um, um, to demonstrate to them all the, um, you know, the the benefits that you're getting from from, um, you know, implying to a new standard basically. 
That's questions right on time, I guess. Is that right, Greg? <laughs> Perfectly on time. <laughs> One one forty four it says on my clock. Um so yeah, so people if you just want to go onto the question box on the GoToWebinar application there and, and ask any questions. Um, so we've got a question here from Reza, I assume. Uh, what type of evidence do we need to provide to show we have identified and interacted with all, all our inter, inter, interested parties? What type of evidence um, that I what can. type of evidence do we ha need to show that we've we've you know met? Um, so she carried, I, think I've got the, I mean, regardless of our internal reports checklist, do we need any external evidence like minutes of meetings or communications, e.g. Yeah. with local communities yeah. or surveys to understand the interests? Interested parties. OK, yeah. so I'll just brought up the, the slide. Um, that's a very good question. So basically, if I understood it right, um, um, Reza, if I got the name right, um, Reza is asking what sort of evidence businesses are required to um, to show to the to the auditor in regards to complying to this um, yes, aspect of party. the standard. Yeah, for interested party. Um, basically, it depends what um, um, which interested party. So on on our example of the customer, um, you know. Um, in that second box from from the right side of it, the, the second column, um, that's where you identify. I mean, in this example, okay, this is this is a just a format that we're, we're recommending. Otherwise, you could you could put it in any other exam um, format. But in that example, that in that box, that's where we are identifying which process will take care of that interested party. So over here, we said we've, we've identified two processes to do that. That's our customer surveys and customer CARs. So again, coming back to my um, to the comment that I made for you minutes earlier we're doing all of this to improve the business right so um, you know having having a list of interested parties um, uh, which you know you don't fully buy into like what, what am I using this this form for um, this is yes you would certify to the standard but at the end of the day you're not achieving any good for your business you know so this is actually the opportunity to say, well, customers have impact on us and we have impact on our customers. What processes do we have in our business that we are managing that that well? So, okay, we have a customer survey that we do once a year and this is how we, we understand um, uh, what they feel about our, our services and products and also we have that avenue of our sales team every time they get a complaint from our um, customers they would lodge a, a CAR in our system and that gets investigated and, and coordinated and so on so that would be your evidence okay so your supplier example might be your supplier CARs your um, stakeholder example might be your, um, your you know your quarterly meeting with the stakeholders and, and meeting minutes to show them how um, how the business is performing. Your local community could be your newsletters. Your employees could be your employee newsletters. Um, your union might be, you know, the, the other meetings that you have with union and delegates and, and so on. So each one of these, you do have um, some sort of um, business practices that you're managing and if you don't you basically should <laughs> so this is an opportunity to 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 identify it yeah yeah exactly so Did that answer it? yeah I think so absolutely yeah if, if if there is no evidence then there's a gap so you need to fill that yeah. with some sort of evidence so you need to think you know outside the box and work out how you're gonna you know capture evidence to prove that you're actually communicating and and understanding their needs and expectations um, you know, there's other ones with customers as well. You may have some sales reps that go and visit them every week or something like that. So the yeah. sales reps might keep notes of that communication. You know, there might be, yeah, there's all sorts of different things. Yeah. Reza says, very good, thank you. Um, now, Catherine's asking, please could you give an example of recording and communicating positive trends in reducing quality defects with audits? Okay. Um, let me see if I could bring a slide. I think, yeah, I think it falls under this category. Yes. Um, 
Okay, so basically that's that's the evidence-based decision making, you know. So you may have um so one of the businesses I work with, they have a monthly risk base um audit. Okay, so at the end of the month when the KPI of um, operations uh, quality comes out, they will look at the trend and say, okay, in this one department we seem to have emerging risk of you know certain defects. Um, so basically over there you see how many uh, you know if you if you break them down into categories you see that that is a category of defects that you're having in certain department and then you would do an audit on it in that in your audit you may want to review the processes you may want to review the training matrices matrix uh, you may want to review the and the supervision and the tools um, you know there's all sort of things that you would build it basically build it into your or the template in a, in a way and then you would identify what is the gap and um, you would put some actions you have some audit um, um, internal audit findings that you would allocate as either you know some businesses they would allocate a car to that internal audit finding and uh, and send it to the manager um, some businesses they they label it as an improvement either way um, you'll have some actions and the, and the following months you would review if you had a positive trend on that if you didn't you have to visit you know visit it um, again and identify what is going wrong um, uh, what measurement that you put in place that is not um, affecting it and um, if it is then that's that's good you know you have to communicate it and, and, and celebrate the, the, the tangible outcome that you had um, so this is this is the beauty of um, you know evidence based decision making because um, you know it's, it's often um, a, a very small issue in certain department if they're louder about expressing it that all of a sudden becomes the entire company's focus and say oh we need to solve that and then you actually put some stats behind it um, you realize that you're spending far too much resource for a very little gain um, to be obtained really um, so it's it's really uh, that's easy whatever you want to focus on you put some um, not numbers behind it that what is it that you're trying to achieve what is in a scope out of scope what is the objective of changing a process or reviewing a process and you would review that would that answer yes, that? I think so yep uh, so Catherine also she made a nice comment uh, so she said thanks Craig she finds my blog very useful I, I'm just putting this in just to promote myself uh, other team <laughs> members are using it as well so thank you uh, Catherine um, so we're running out of questions. If anybody's got any other questions, I've got another question. Um, so when the auditors come on site and they're auditing your systems, are they especially looking at the 2015 changes, or are they go, going through and doing the whole the whole audit? Is is that how how are the auditors um, doing the audits? Just so that you know, are they looking at those? just those changes when they're doing an audit or are they doing a full systems audit um, um, I would in my experiences they would um, the, the huge aspects of their focus would be on the changes um, mm -hmm. that um, but um, if you refer back to the slide that I put on the core yeah what remains the same yeah they would certainly they would certainly review this it will certainly review this. Um, these are just standard, you know, in any auditor will look at your corrective action system, you know, your customer satisfaction, management review, internal audit, process control, non-conforming product, uh, have not come across um, any audit that they would not touch on these ones. These are the, the foundation of, of your um, um, system. Mm -hmm. um, but they would definitely um, touch on um, the interested parties, you know, process approach, risks and opportunities, yep. um, you know, all these, um, the, the, the changes that would definitely, um, because they're, they're certifying you to the new standard, so that would really doesn't make sense if they don't look whether you comply to it or not, in a yeah, sense. Yeah, 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 understand. It was just that for us here at Mango, yeah. we were a brand new system, so they just did a full system audit. I'm just interested in those companies that are already certified, do they focus on? Um, yeah. So Ali's um, come in with a really interesting question. I don't think we've got enough time to be able to answer it fully, but um, 
He's saying no, no industry is exempted from design and development of products. How does this work for the service industry? For example, uh, at Symbian, we don't manufacture products, but supply pharmaceuticals to chemists and hospitals. So they're providing like a, a, a service to, to those. They're not actually manufacturing the, the drugs, but they're actually, you know, uh, distributing them. So how does design and development um, uh, come in with services? Um, design and development is basically um, uh, you are in a sense you are your development you know those concepts that you are um, you will go through a, a, a development of the concept um, in your research and development I would presume um, so design and development does not necessarily need to be uh, for a product that that design and development is it could be a development as in a re research and development side of it for for the practices that you're doing in, in your line of industry um, if you're changing a process that may have an impact on those you know pharmacy and all of that you will need to um, there they would be considered as one of your interested parties um, you would need to communicate that to them um, it's it's um, it's basically that is the approach that um, the, in 2015 it says it's not really a product in a sense of a physical product that you're giving um, mm -hmm. if you're if you're selling out a drawing you know or if you're selling out a service that you're giving um, these are all the things that um, some sort of you know, thought has gone to it, some sort of development has gone to it to come up with that concept and over that you would have a PVDV process basically. Um, yes, yeah, so, so, so from what I understand of some of you, I've, I've been there a few times, you know, there's certainly design and development of the service provision that you're providing to your customers. So the, so the customer wants you to store their, their drugs, they want them to be well maintained, you know, they need to be in whatever the conditions, you know, refrigerated or not. And then um, you need to then distribute them appropriately in the appropriate bottles or whatever it is, and then sent to the appropriate chemist. So the design of that whole process is still design and development. You've still yes, got to yes. design it. You've still got to review it. You've got to verify that it works. And then you've got to validate it to say that, you know, the customer's happy with that. So the, the provision of service is has to be designed and so there's design yes. and development that's a whole we could have a whole webinar just talking about that yes so, and yeah, that's we're a running topic, short yeah. <laughs> um so ali's saying it's also a legislative requirement as well so um the design of your services you've got to think about that so you know if you're not designing products you've got to look at well, what services are we providing so the service of you know providing customer service to, cu to customers is is you know you've got to design and develop that and review it and you know you've got inputs you've got outputs you've got um, reviews you know you've got to verify that you get you're doing good customer service and and asking the customer with validation to say did they get good service so you know the whole service provision thing needs design and development around it hopefully that answers your question Ali um, but yeah we could see if you want to I could run another webinar on that and find another expert Maybe you, Sean, can come back and tell us about that. <laughs> Find another expert. <laughs> uh, okay, so we're at the end, uh, everyone. So thank you all for uh, attending. It's a really, really popular um, uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, I've had he excellent feedback on it. So, um, you know, my advice uh, is, is get in early now. As, as um, our customers are saying just this morning, uh, the certification bodies don't want this big wave of work in September of next year because they won't be able to get round to it. You've got to get in early, follow the, the Plan Do Check Act process that, that Sean's put in there. You know, if you need help, obviously contact Sean. He's more than happy. He's, you know, he's been out with customers and done this already. So, um, you know, contact him. Get your plans in place. You know, follow the Plan Do Check Act. Um, and, but start now because... Uh, the, the certification bodies are going to become really stressed if you guys want to get certified and they're not, not going to have enough auditors. So get in there now. Um, so thank you all for attending today's webinar. Um, if you have any questions, just forward them through to me. Uh, just send them through on email or send them direct to Sean. You've, you saw his con contact details there. You know, you can give him a call, send him an email. But certainly jump onto his website there. Sean's a, a lean expert as well. Um, uh, and uh, 
uh, you know, and has um, amazing experience around lean manufacturing. So uh, talk to uh, talk to Sean about some of that stuff. Check, check that out on his website. Uh, so also, so I'm about to start processing this uh, recording of the webinar. So I'll send that out uh, tomorrow. So that'll be a recording of the webinar plus all the slides. You're more than welcome to share that with your colleagues. Um, and look out for the next webinar. Um, I unfortunately had to cancel last month's webinar due to ill health by the presenter. So hopefully we'll have him back for the next webinar. Um, but uh, just confirming that uh, at the moment. So thank you, Sean, again. Uh, no worries. We, thank you. Yeah. And thanks to everyone for attending. And uh, have a great Mango Day. So thank you all.